Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see all these faces. Uh, thank you, Sergu, for inviting me. Uh, and I'll wear the blue hoodie well back in, uh, in New York City. Uh, so I'm an artist. Uh, my work deals with identity and value. Uh, I leverage uh, various uh, technological methods and media to distill emotional value through the use of proxies. About 30 years ago, 1989, exactly 30 years ago, uh, is when I first identified as an artist. Um, this is to say that uh, I identified uh, with myself, I, it was an admission uh, to myself and to my friends that uh, I was making art with the intention of making art. Uh, sure, I was making art before and, and every three-year-old makes art, but it was at this point that I realized that the questions that I wanted answers to in life, uh, science and math, uh, couldn't answer them away from me, whereas with art, I was able to come closer to a, a, a truth that, uh, that resonated with me. Um, I use, and I have used for a long time, photographic methods to create proxies out of images. An example, uh, for instance, uh, a drop of crude oil uh, is a proxy for life itself. Its very being uh, is the result of millions of years of uh, organic decay. Uh, an arrangement of flowers that looks like it's ready to be thrown out uh, actually exists uh, in everlasting life uh, as a reminder to me of uh, the first days of fatherhood. It was a gift uh, for the birth of my first child. Um, a potato uh, for me is a proxy uh, for the shared human experience. That's a long story, happy to discuss with you uh, later. But I'm not really here to speak about uh, photography, I'm here to speak about blockchain as a method. Um, but the potato is a good place to start. Uh, this potato is titled uh, potato number 345. Um, I think it's fair to say it's uh, the most famous work that I've done. Um, it made a lot of news uh, back in, I think, 2016 because it sold for a rather large sum of money. Um, and from this period, from 2016 to 2018, uh, I realized uh, an alarming trend that the attention was shifting from the artistic value of my work to the uh, monetary value of my work, which is not ideal. As an artist, you don't want to feel commodified in this way. Um, uh, you know, I started to feel actually something like a currency. Um, so I know a lot of people here uh, live and breathe blockchain, but has anybody here actually bled for the blockchain? Have you spilled blood? Because I have, and I'm going to explain why and how. Uh, as a, as, a, as a reaction to this commodification of Kevin Abosh, I decided to control the narrative by doing what? By tokenizing myself on the blockchain in the form of 10 million pieces of virtual art, each divisible to 18 decimal places. Mechanically, it was an ERC-20 token. Uh, and I wanted this to be connected uh, to me in a meaningful way. So my wife, she's a, a doctor, uh, makes it easy to have blood drawn. You see, there's the blood. Um, some people are squeamish. Uh, and then I had a rubber stamp made, and with my blood, I imprinted on physical artworks uh, the contract address for I am a coin. Uh, and, and, and I felt that this uh, created an inextricable tie between the virtual work and the physical work. In the same way a, a cryptographic algorithm works unidirectionally, with the private key you can deduce the wallet address, but with the wallet address you can't deduce the private key. I felt, and I think this is particularly interesting, that the physical work could not have a meaningful existence were it not for the creation of this virtual blockchain work. Well, after I uh, unveiled this project, uh, CNN and other news networks uh, around the globe uh, did stories on this, and uh, within minutes, I was receiving phone calls from Silicon Valley, from Hong Kong, from the Middle East. Uh, they wanted to, to buy an IAMA coin. I thought they wanted to buy an IAMA coin. In fact, they wanted to buy many of them. They wanted to buy in units of 10,000 and 100,000. And so the irony wasn't lost on me that I was being re-commodified. They were speculating now on the value of, of this artist. Uh, a friend of mine, a former prosecutor for the Securities and Exchange Commission, was especially uh, amused by this and, uh, and pointed out. And remember, this is January 2018. Uh, everybody's ICOing, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission getting a little tough on regulation, trying to figure out uh, what's a security, what's not a security. And, uh, and, and, and they, were, they were interested in the fact that there was no utility 
uh, to my uh, my token. Uh, it was not uh, uh, being marketed as a as an investment as a security token. It was a piece of art. And were they about to engage uh, an artist who's been making art for 30 years and tell me that the art I made is not art? So it's not the first uh, time I worked with blockchain uh, I I as a method to make art. In fact, in late 2012, 2013, uh, I became really, really fascinated by the fact that I could create uh, these cryptographic hashes and blockchain addresses, uh, as you know, uh, without limitation, without any chance of collision. Uh, not only did I see them as a, a really uh, conceptually an interesting uh, store of value, uh, but I knew that at some point uh, that these alphanumerics would serve me uh, to create proxies. Uh, and this was certainly my, my first blockchain uh, foray. Uh, few people have come up to me here and they said, are you the rose guy? And uh, I, I am in fact the rose guy. Uh, this uh, photograph of a rose, uh, also uh, made the rounds around the world. Um, after my I Am A Coin project, a friend of mine, uh, founder of a, of, a, of a decentralized gifting platform called Gifto, Andy Tian, contacted me and he said, how do you like to do something for uh, Valentine's Day? Make a piece of art for us, a non-fungible token. Uh, and we agreed that that would be a good idea if we, uh, if we gave the proceeds to charity. We did to the Coder Dojo Foundation, which was an open source, uh, is an open source uh, platform for teaching children all over the world how to code. Um, and, and so I, I, I turned to a, a rather trite, uh, cliche symbol of love, uh, the rose. Um, and again, the news was made when 10 individuals uh, came together to buy uh, this work for one million dollars worth of cryptocurrency. But what they didn't realize is that it wasn't uh, a photograph of a rose. It wasn't an NFT even attached to a photograph of a rose. There was no visual or physical component. It was literally just an ERC-721 NFT. And so I actually was doing a press tour here in Korea around it, uh, which <laughs> we, we, this was really something actually. After two hours of explaining that this work had no physical or virtual um, uh, manifestation, I, I still had journalists coming up to me at the end saying, so does the actual coin have a picture of a rose on it? Uh, at which point I almost passed out from uh, disbelief. Um, but I met crypto traders uh, here, uh, big, you know, big players in Bitcoin, and they said to me, but if you can't see it and you can't hold it and you can't put it on the wall, uh, yeah, how is this art? Uh, and, and where's the value? Which I thought was crazy coming from people that buy invisible coins. And then conversely, the art world, they were like, oh yeah, nice picture of a rose. Oh wait, there is no picture, it's nothing? Oh, that's really cool, but what's with these crazy people who buy invisible coins? So that disconnect, I've always thought very interesting. And, and this is the real value that I get out of doing this sort of work is trying to better understand how and why we value anything at all, which is sort of at the core of uh, the whole world of cryptocurrency. So in playing with this notion of how the public engages with value, this is a work called Stealing the Contents of This Wallet is a Crime. This is a work I put up on social media. And uh, as it says, if you, you, look, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. The top uh, alphanumeric is the wallet address, the bottom is the private key, I figured it would take 10 minutes before the contents were taken. What were the contents? I put 100 IAMA coins in there, so pieces of me. But it didn't take 10 minutes, it took five days. Five days of people taking little bits out, even putting some back in, weird numbers like 0.666 IAMA coins, you know, they were playing with it. But ultimately, after five, uh, five days, they were all gone. And uh, which made me think that one, an art crime had taken place, they were duly warned, and second, because they were pieces of me, uh, I would argue that it was a kidnapping, something considerably more disturbing. So I actually never really cared about cryptocurrency. I've been deeply involved in blockchain technology from, from the beginning, uh, but I did start to care about cryptocurrency when people started uh, paying me for it, exchanging it for my art. Um, at that point, uh, I started to engage with the crypto uh, community at large on social media, and I came across this, uh, this fantastic notion of the Lambo, the Lamborghini. Uh, it sure seemed like there were a lot of people out there um, who, who, when they make that billion dollars, were going to rush out and buy a Lambo. Hashtag Lambo, everybody's heard of hashtag Lambo, right? And I thought that was vulgar, but what I came to realize was 
this wasn't vulgar at all. It was a playful declaration to their tribe uh, that they were part of this insanity, this crypto zeitgeist uh, that was occurring. And I think uh, 20, 30 years from now, we'll look back at it and, and see this. And I wanted to encapsulate this, uh, encapsulate this in, a, uh, in a work of art. So if the Lamborghini is this proxy for success identity and hashtag Lambo, I decided I'm going to make another token called Yellow Lambo with a total supply of one, not divisible. But unlike some of the other works where the token is the resultant output, it's the final artwork, this served as an intermediary proxy, which then informed the final artwork, which was a uh, which is an, a three meter wide neon sculpture uh, of the contract address for the Yellow Lambo token. Uh, an interesting footnote is, it sold for more than the cost of a Lamborghini Aventador car. Uh, one of the highlights of, uh, of my career, in fact, and this last year, I was invited to uh, show some work at Russia's uh, Hermitage Museum, next to Rembrandt and Friends, and I showed uh, canvas sacks uh, with wallet addresses uh, emblazoned uh, across them. Inside them, again, I put in some of my IAMA coins, pieces of me. I threw away the, uh, the private keys in this case, so forever they were in a state of purgatory. This piece was called Personal uh, Effects. And uh, uh, there was a press conference with the director of the Hermitage Museum. Uh, the journalists uh, came up, and uh, there's always one who has to ask, but is this art? And I love the answer uh, from the director of the Hermitage. He said, it's in the Hermitage Museum. It must be art. Uh, one of the most uh, satisfying projects uh, that, that, I've, uh, that I've realized uh, is, uh, was called Priceless uh, with my friend and fellow artist uh, Ai Weiwei. Uh, in an effort to bring some attention to the refugee crisis around the world, uh, we embarked on this project. So one of the things I realized uh, with this journey is people's complicated relationship with value. Uh, from the moment we come into this world, people try to ascribe value to us. They say, that boy, he's so full of potential, that girl, she's worthless, and it's completely perverse. And if you think people have a complicated relationship with uh, things they can ascribe value to, imagine how complicated it is with things that are priceless. Would everybody in here agree, I'm hoping everybody agrees, that life itself is priceless? By a, there we go, good. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Um, well, then, logically, every single moment of your life and every sliver, uh, the most seemingly insignificant, the most banal moment in your life, therefore, should also be priceless. So we created a token called Priceless, PRCLS, another ERC20 token, but there were only two. And one was absolutely unattainable, therefore priceless. The other one, divisible to 18 decimal places, enough for everybody in the world to have a little share of it, was also therefore priceless. We, what we did is, in, in recognition of the fact that these seemingly insignificant moments uh, are priceless, we went forward with great intention uh, for a week, uh, picking out random moments like sharing tea, walking in a carefree manner down a street, the time that he said to me, I don't know why he did this, but he said, I had a big nose. I said, oh, you have a big nose. These became the works, the moments that we, we tokenized in the form of uh, alphanumerics. Uh, and again, uh, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was an exercise. You know, we're artists, we make art. But it was also something that brought a little bit of visibility to the, uh, the, the global refugee crisis. Um, so, I mean, you can understand why I'm sort of the poster child for, for blockchain art, which I hated, actually, when I first heard it, people calling me a blockchain artist. I didn't like when people called me a photographer. In fact, I don't like labels. But I've grown into this crypto art, blockchain art thing. Uh, it's, I'm stuck with it, probably, for the rest of my life. Um, the, uh, the question that most interviews end with is, what's your next blockchain project going to be, uh, to which I usually say, uh, I don't know if I'll ever do another blockchain project, knowing that I probably will. Uh, and so the question today is, what is my next big thing? Well, there is something I've been working on for quite some time now, uh, and I'm very excited to announce it here. I've never announced this uh, publicly. Uh, we weren't even going to announce it really in a big, splashy way. Uh, but it's called Blockchain Films. Uh, we say it's the future of film production, finance, and distribution. 
Um, essentially, we are going to be producing uh, a slate of films. Uh, film financing is taking place via private equity and a token sale and token swaps uh, with, uh, with partners. Uh, there's going to be membership entitlements for token holders that speak to uh, uh, future value. Uh, distribution of the films is going to be a hybrid of uh, blockchain uh, empowered uh, VOD, video on demand, and conventional distribution through cinema. 25% uh, of the films we produce are going to be uh, franchise focused, meaning there'll be sequels. 50% of the production slate uh, science fiction, because uh, I think science fiction, I'm not even, I haven't even been a traditionally a science fiction fan, but I've grown into it because I realize how vital and how important science fiction is to inspire scientists of the future. Uh, very ambitious uh, 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 film production schedule. We're going to do four films in 2020, three times as many in 2021, and 16 films in 2022, which will certainly put us as one of the largest film studios in the world. Um, Yes, we will be doing Korean films too, thank you very much, yes, uh, playing to the crowd, but we will. Our first film is actually a uh, Korean language film shot between Seoul and New York, most of it New York, uh, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. The first question is, uh, the reason why the art work is tran transacted uh, in, an in an expensive way or the value of art is comes from uh, the original version. So it is controversial whose artwork is the original version or a copy version. But Forever Road, such digital work, artwork, is same between the original version and copy version, so there is no need to uh, have the original version. Then, why do people uh, buy such expensive digital art? Right. So I'm not sure wh what the, the part was about original uh, versus uh, reproduction, uh, but, I, but let's just talk about why people buy art in general. I think that's what's really here, is why do you ascribe value to that? Yes, yes. Sir. Actually, the, art, the, the artwork uh, value comes from the original version, right? No, I, I completely disagree with that, that assertion. Well, it, 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 that, that was the question, so you can yeah, deliver yeah, your yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, I'm used to this, especially in Korea, I have to say. Very traditionalist here when it comes to art. No, no offense, I hope. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting because uh, this notion of the original being more valuable, this notion... Well, first off, what is the original? See, there's, there, there, there's a misunderstanding there that the, that the photograph of the rose, I'm guessing, was the original. That was, that was, a, that was an, a proxy, an intermediary step, right? So in this case, the original is the NFT, okay? Yeah. The, the, the original is the non-fungible token. But really, the question here, again, whether original or uh, facsimile, is why do people part with their money for art? That's really at what's at stake here. And, and it goes deeper to why do we do the same with an altcoin, or why do we spend money on a particular brand of clothing? Well, let's face it, people buy art for three reasons. And this is particularly interesting, because I was coached, actually, again, by Securities and Exchange Commission people in, the, in America about how to present how people buy art. I said that there are three reasons why. They buy art because they appreciate it, they want to experience it, it's experiential. They want to dwell in the same space with the art, that's one reason. The second reason is a form of social proof or validation. Hey, look at me, I've got pretty good taste, I've got a Kevin Abosh on the wall, right? And then the third is investment. Mm -hmm. And the securities and exchange people say, don't say investment. But, but, I, but it's true, people buy art, people, I didn't make this up, people buy art as an investment, don't say investment. Well, am I going to deny that that's not a factor when people buy art? Because the fact is, people usually buy art for more than one reason. It's usually two. I've done it myself. Uh, I saw something I liked, then I found out that that artist was uh, showing in a fancy museum, and it just pushed me over the edge. I've seen people buy work that they were lukewarm about, that they 
They, they, they liked it, but it wasn't, oh, but it might go up in value? Okay, I buy it. And conversely, I've seen uh, people buy, uh, buy work completely irrationally. But the, the, the point is that there are a number of reasons why people buy art. And the experiential one, I think, is really important when we're talking about virtual art. Why would somebody buy one of my Iama coins? One, not 100,000, that's a whole other story. Or why would they buy a virtual rose? I'll tell you why. The value is in the experience. The value is in take partaking, being part of it. At least that's, that's where I see the value. When you have people over for dinner and there's nothing to talk about, and like, well, so uh, I bought a piece of art that you can't see or hold or put on the wall. Really? Tell me about it. <laughs> Seriously, the ensuing conversation. Look, it's, it's something of an elitist uh, notion, but um, I think there's a younger generation, too, who is mobile. They may not even have a, a home. They don't have a place to put a, a big painting on the wall. But sharing in this artistic process, I think, brings great value. Okay, thank you very much. Winded, <laughs> I get passionate about this stuff. <laughs> and there is another question for you. Bring it on. Yes, the next question is, the development of technology is always inspiring art artists. So with the development of blockchain technology, what kind of impact do you think is making to art area? Sure. So, um, I mean, you see a lot of uh, blockchain uh, startups around. Uh, they're going facil to facilitate uh, the art market. They're going to... Uh, um, you know whether it's matters addressing uh, matters of authenticity and and uh, and provenance and 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 stuff like that, uh, and and they're breaking through to varying degrees. I, I'm not really involved with that myself. Uh, as a, as a uh, I use it obviously as a method, but I think, look, the reason I'm interested in blockchain from the beginning is the sense of empowering those who feel disempowered, right? Uh, shifting power from institutions to individuals. This has always been of paramount importance to me. So I can imagine that uh, you know, blockchain technology can be emp empowering to an artist in the same way that for decades, mechanical processes and then later digital processes have empowered artists by being able to reach a larger, uh, a larger audience. So in that sense, I think uh, a blockchain technology will only continue to empower creatives. Yeah, that is ideal. And next question is, in terms of the issue of token, uh, there is ERC, which can be dividable, and there another one is ERC721, which cannot be dividable. So to make an con artistic concept, what kind of interpretation do you use? Well, I, I, as I showed, I've used both. Uh, I've used, they, 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 they serve different purposes. There are new protocols on the horizon that, uh, I mean, functionally, uh, for me, they work in a similar in a similar way mm -hmm. um, if you if you're going to tie uh, a, a physical or or visual asset uh, to a token uh, probably 721 mm -hmm. makes more sense okay yeah. thank you very much and next question is Sorry, for the sake of time, we it's will okay. wrap up the Q&A session. No, 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 it's okay. I find it very, <laughs> very relaxing uh, looking over the sea of people. <laughs> so, do you, okay. No. The operator said that there is a shortage of time, but uh, 혹시 질문 있으신 분 계실까요? Thank you very much. Maybe you have delivered a good presentation, so it's enough to deliver a <laughs> perfect content. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 네, 수고해주신 KBN 아버지 작가님에게 큰 박수 부탁드립니다.